There are three major questions asked every time this truth is shared. Three questions. Number one, the first question that is asked is, can this be true? If you want to know why what we preach is called the gospel, this is why. The word gospel was used only two times in the Greek lexicon. The original meaning of the word. In fact, English language does not use that word often. So in the whole ancient Greek, that word was cast. It's only twice that word was used in its original sense. Because there is nothing. The word gospel actually means too good to be true. It's not good news. The word gospel is not good news. The word gospel means too good to be true. And there was nothing on earth too good to be true. Until Jesus came and pro produced this. That a man is guilty. He doesn't do anything about it. And that thing that should cost him death. And not that died for him. And kept him safe. So if you don't know this, you have not known the gospel. The first question you ask is, is this true? Unless the word of God means nothing to you. But if the word of God means something to you, then it is true because it is written in black and white. The second question that always emanates when this truth is shared is, if this is true, are we supposed to ask for it before we receive it? Because you will always find the argument. There are schools of thought that believe that, well, it's true that God forgave us our future sins, but every time we sin, we need to come and tell God, Lord, I'm sorry. If we don't say I'm sorry, we can't receive it. There's a school of thought that don't accept that it's true at all. They don't accept the gospel. Then there's a school of thought that accepts that it's true. But their only problem is that if you sin, you must ask for forgiveness. Why will you not ask for forgiveness and you just receive it? So their anger is that if you don't ask for forgiveness, you can't receive forgiveness. Both of them are wrong. And I'll explain to you why. The reason God forgave you was not because you asked him for forgiveness. If you study salvation, you won't find anywhere that the Bible says, ask God, please forgive me. He said, if you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, and confess with your mouth, you are saved. Because if asking for forgiveness can save you, then God was unfair to the people in the Old Testament. Because they asked God for forgiveness for a long time. God didn't forgive them. The only basis by which God forgives you is your faith in what Jesus has done. Believing that in Christ you are safe. That's what keeps you safe. And I will show you scripture. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. Because there are three scriptures for this argument. Number one is 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible said that but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. He said, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. Now, see why it said so. Verse 9. So this is Bible study. That's why we are dealing with these matters. It's not an encounter service. Verse 9. Okay, let's read from verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Do you see why I told you that God does not record your sin? Does not mean you are not sinning. There are two different things. Because I will go to the third question people ask. Some people say that if God is not crediting sin, then we are not sinning. That's not true. It's possible that you are sinning. Although God is not crediting it because God doesn't want you to come under his rod. But you are sinning. And because you are sinning, there are consequences attached to it. And I will come into that. So that God is not crediting it does not mean you are not sinning. The Bible did not say you are not sinning. The Bible says, blessed is the man to whom his sins are covered to whom God does not credit sin or charge against him. The Bible didn't say the man is not sinning. The man is sinning, but God decided to forgive him by removing the guilt. So there are two different things, and I'm coming to it. In verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the argument here is twofold. There are those who say, what we confess is not necessarily, Lord, I fornicated, Lord, I lied. What we confess is what Jesus has done. They say it's homologia, saying what the Bible says. Because a man who sins, God says he's forgiving. So when you come, instead of saying, God, I've lied, forgive me, you rather come and say, Lord, thank you for the forgiveness that is in Christ Jesus, I receive it. That's their argument. And their argument is that they don't want you to build sin consciousness. And then there's another school of thought that says, the Bible says, confess sin. So if you sin, like David, he said, my sins are before me. You must tell God that you have sinned. If you don't confess that sin, God will not forgive you. Both of them are wrong. And this is why. If you say somebody must confess his sin, then you don't know what sin is. Because sin is not fornication alone. Sin is not lying alone. When we are dealing with sin, we are dealing with sin in twofold. There is sin by omission and there is sin by commission. Now, a man will not grow if he's sinning by commission. That is consciously using his will to sin. But over and above, and that's why you see when we preach, especially in revival services, you see us attacking people for sinning. Stop sinning. Not everybody is sinning. We are referring to using your will to consciously sin. If you continue like that, you will not grow. And I will show you the consequences. But there are other sins that are by omission. Can I assure you something? 99% of the Christians will die with sin. But it will not be seen by commission. It will be seen by omission. And the reason is because the Bible defines sin in a strange way in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they listed different things that are sin. All of them is based on acts and omission. But when you come into the New Testament, the equation changed. The Bible said, whatever is not of faith is sin. And so as you are sitting now, if God says, empty your bank, your, your whole account, and you don't, you have sinned. And that sin is equivalent to fornication. As you are sitting now, if God says, pray for this blind man, and you don't pray, you have sinned. And that sin is equivalent to murder. The day you are supposed to die, if you are afraid, you have sinned. <laughs> See why people talk about sin boldly? It's because they think sin is fornication. And because they are not fornicating, they start talking, talking with audacity. Meanwhile, the guy who is talking like that is afraid. Because in that same service, there is somebody on a wheelchair. God said, lift him up. <laughs> lift him up. What if it doesn't happen? James 2.10, the Bible said, if you fail in one, you fail in all. So the guy who is afraid is also a murderer. He's also a fornicator. But you see, that sin may not be something he exacts his will consciously. Now, there are other things that define sin. If you are envious of somebody, you have sin. If somebody is rising and you are afraid, ah, you see that somebody exploded and your heart skipped, you are sin. You have sinned. Because it's not of faith. And there are many things that are not of faith. Faith actually means live supernaturally. So if you are not living su supernaturally, you are a sinner. <laughs> because faith is calling those things that be not as though they were. So if you are not living your life as calling those things as be, that be not as though they were, you are a sinner. Do you see what sin is? That's why, that's why God forgives us. So if somebody is insisting that he must confess his sins, he can never finish confessing them. That's why that school of thought is wrong. Because even you sitting here, you don't know all your sins. In fact, let me shock you again. The Bible said in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. It says, hearing is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. You know what that means? As you grow in God, any faith level you enter, God will show you another standard. There is a realm you will get to in God that if you don't pray, it's a sin. That's why Samuel said, I will not sin against God by not praying for you. This is not prayer for himself. This is prayer for another person. 
Because as you are working with God, sometimes you become a gatekeeper. Because there are realms in life and there are realms in intimacy. For example, you have a gatekeeper, you have a watcher, and you have an intercessor. That's the lowest level of prayer. Prayer that secures territories. A watcher is under obligation to see anything that enters the city. Because it's the first defense system over a city. That means if you have grown and God has called you a watcher and you are quiet and headsmen invade the territory, you have sinned. Because you didn't alarm the body of Christ that war was coming. If you are a gatekeeper and the headsmen succeed in invading and you couldn't stop them by prayer, you have sinned. Because you let the gate porous. If you kept the gate, they would not have entered. If you are an intercessor and that thing is happening and you are sleeping and you are not bringing charge against them before God for judgment to be passed, God won't do anything because you didn't act. You have sinned. Now, that level is not for a young believer. A young believer can sleep and he will thank God because he gives sleep to his beloved. <laughs> so the higher you go, the more complex the sin matter becomes. And so if you are saying you will only be forgiven when you confess, then I'm telling you, you cannot confess all your sins because you don't know them. And then the second thing is that if you are saying we are only confessing what God says to confess, then it's not correct because the Bible said if we confess our sins. It didn't say if we confess what Christ has done. So both schools of thought are wrong. It's not saying we should confess what Christ has done and it's not insisting that we must confess all our sins because we don't know all our sins. We can only identify all the sins we use our will to commit. But there are many more things that are against us because now we have been called to live only by faith. He said the just shall live by faith. And faith living is supernatural living, calling those things that be not as though they were. And there are few people that are living at that level. Are we together? So, the doctrine of forgiveness is deeper than just confessing your sin. Because if you move from here and you go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, hear what the Bible says. It said, I write unto you, children, that you sin not. And he's saying this so that you will not go and say, God has allowed us to sin. God has not allowed us to sin. God has given us forgiveness. The Bible says the long suffering of God, the patience of God, walketh repentance. So God has given us a long rope of forgiveness so that we'll have enough time to grow above sin. He has not given us ticket for sinning. He said, where much sin abound? He said, grace abounds much more. Because wherever there is sin, there is the ability to live above sin. If you continue in sin, it's your choice and there are consequences. Are we together? So in 1 John 2 verse 1, he said, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. He said, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the propitiation for sin. Here, he didn't say you confess. Because you are not even where the penalty was written. This is before the Father. The person who is speaking there is the advocate. It's just like you go to court and you say, I will speak. There is a lawyer that will speak on your behalf. Because if you want to speak there, the way you address the judge alone can cause another problem for you. Because you can be in court of appeal and you are addressing the judge like a customary judge. That your address, they will now say, shut up, don't speak again. So it will be, a, it will be an issue, but your greeting, your salutation will be a problem. So there is a realm you get to that they don't even need you to speak. Only Jesus has the qualification to speak for you. That's where the blood speaks. Because at that place, it's not mouth that speaks, it's blood that speaks. And your blood is not pure. It's only the blood of Jesus that can talk there. So if you are saying you must confess your sin, what if you come to the court where it is only the blood of the pure that you speak and you don't have that blood? So there is a realm where it's only Jesus that speaks. And then if you live here and you go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, the Bible now says, I write unto you little children because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. So now he's not even forgiving you because of you. He's forgiving you because of his name's sake. So forgiveness is deeper than what you are confessing. That's why when the prodigal son came to the father, he said, I'm not qualified to be your son. Get out. 
Do you think this prayer you are praying can bring the inheritance you squandered? You have squandered your inheritance. You come here to speak English. You went to the hotel. You paid. You off night. You pulled your clothes. After you fornicated, you now came and said, eh, eh. That thing you did is tantamount to death. This is your cry. Can't stop death. What you should do is thank God for what Christ has done for you. This is the foundation of victory over sin. We are arguing theology instead of appreciating God. And because we are not appreciating God, the power is not yet activated. In Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, it said that the communication of your faith will become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that he has done or wrought in you. It is when you start acknowledging what Jesus has done, which begins with forgiveness, that the power to live over sin is activated. But there are questions that theologians will keep asking. And you see, for those who study, they are not new things. But you see, when because the church largely don't study anything you say is Rema. Go today and study about Arminism and then Calvinism. You see that one save, always save, has been an argument of over 100 years. It's not a new thing. All the positions people are taking have been documented. People have written PhD tests on it. But Christians are not reading. They just come to church and receive prophecy and shout and go home and continue singing. So the second question is, should we confess or should we not confess? Well, this is the answer. Having shown you this, that number one, there is confession. Number two, Jesus, the propitiation. And then number three, for his name's sake, you know that this business is beyond confession. Because confession stops in 1 John 1, 9. If you go to 1 John 2, 1, Jesus is the one talking, not you. And then if you go to 1 John 2, 12, God is doing it because of his integrity. He has said you are forgiven, so he can't come back to judge you. So it's for his name's sake that is restrained. So it's deeper than you. However, is it necessary to confess? Yes. Why do you confess? You are not confessing because it's your confession that gives you forgiveness. But for the sake of good conscience, it's important for you to confess. Because if you err against God and you have a relationship with God, you can't come back to God and act as if you did nothing. If you claim you love God and you know God loves you, you can't be in a relationship with your wife and you go and cheat on her and you come back home and you're acting all this way. That means your love is fake. Because true love provokes fidelity. It is because of that fidelity that if we sin, not when we sin, because we are not supposed to sin, but if we sin because we are children, we confess. We are confessing because of conscience. And the Bible said in 1 Timothy 1.19, it says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have shipwrecked their faith. So if you don't manage your conscience, if your conscience dies, your faith will die. And so because of conscience, when a man sins, he needs to weep and repent because he has hurt his lover. He has hurt the one to whom he is expected to be faithful. He has broken the code of fidelity. It will be impossible to return to your lover and act as if all is well. No, it's not possible. If genuinely you were in love with God, your heart will be broken. And in response to your broken heart, in response to good conscience, you will cry and repent bitterly for that sin. When God looks at it, it's a sign that you are reasonable. Because there are many Christians that are unreasonable. And that's why they don't grow. Number three. These are questions that this teaching provokes. So I'm trying to deal with them one after the other. Number three. If this is taught, won't it engender lasciviousness? Because if people discover that their sins are forgiven, then why wouldn't they continue sinning? Three things. The first thing is that it's possible that people will hear this and become lascivious. If you study Jude, verse 3, the Bible said something clearly concerning some that crept in amongst the fold 
that have turned the grace of God onto lasciviousness. There are many people. Such people are unreasonable. Romans 12 verse 1, I beseech you dearly beloved that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. For this is your reasonable offering. There are many Christians that are unreasonable. So when they hear truths like this, they run and say, thank God. God is not counting sin. My brother, wear that uh, cigar they bring her quick. Ooh, they start smoking. The thing is, that thing was in them. They were just pretending and hiding it because of fear. So they were not delivered from it. They were actually guilty because it was in them. Now they just found a reason why they should do it. Oh, my God, no, they, for, they can't see, no. Make I go connect with that, my old relationship. Hello, dear, how you doing? I have missed you. They enter iniquity. They've turned the grace of God to lasciviousness. There are many like that. But they are dangerous. They are dangerous for doing that. The first danger is that you will wreck your conscience. And if you wreck your conscience, your faith will be shipwrecked. And if your faith is shipwrecked, you are finished. Because the just shall live by faith. If you don't live by faith, you'll be defeated in life. This is why you notice that those who live in sin, they are always either in sin, either in sickness, or in frustration, or in pain, because their gates are porous. The defense mechanism we have in life is called the shield of faith. And the Bible said in 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some have not put away, they put away good conscience, concerning their faith. So their faith is shipwrecked. Now that their faith is shipwrecked, when the devil attacks their health, they, health, they can't rise. When the devil attacks their finances, they can't rise because their gates become porous. They become puppets and slaves of demons. This is why you find many Christians in our world today being wrecked. If you see 100,000 Christians, 90,000 are going through problems they can't help themselves about. The reason is because they can't rise up in faith. They have shipwrecked their conscience and because they've shipwrecked their conscience, their faith have been shipwrecked and so they are vulnerable to devils. So anybody who makes a practice of sin because forgiveness is available, yes, God will forgive you, but you'll be a slave of demons. And if you're a slave of demons, you will live a defeated life. Number two, if you make a practice of sin, you are a child. And the problem with the child is that God will never invite you to participate in kingdom. He has forgiven you, but he can't commit kingdom to you. That's why you find many people hoping one day, now one day, God will help them. They can't find it. Because the authority they are looking for is not for children. No matter how you love your child or five years old, you can't give him your car. You can't make him the CEO of your company. So many things God has, but he can't entrust them to you. The reason is because sin is a sign that you are a child. 1 John 2, 1, 2, 12, I write unto you, children. Only children were written to about sins. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, the heir, so long as he's a child, is not different from a servant. So many Christians are servants in the spirit. There is authority for kingdom advancement. God doesn't commit it to them. They can even bear the title of prophet and apostle, but they are servants. Because if an apostle is a fornicator, he's a child and he's a servant. If a prophet is a liar, he's a child and he's a servant. No matter the title you give yourself, God can't give you the authority of the kingdom. So the second danger of turning the grace of God onto lasciviousness, aside the fact that you can wreck your faith and make your life porous, is the fact that you are a servant. You will never grow into kingdom. And if you don't grow into kingdom, your existence was a waste. Because God created man to participate in kingdom. In Genesis 1.28, it says, let them have dominion. You will never know what dominion is in your lifetime. Because dominion is not for children. Dominion is for adults in the kingdom. And when you become an adult, you live above sin. Danger of turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And finally, because of our time, because there are many, is that your salvation is under attack. If you study Ephesians 2 8, salvation was provided by grace, but salvation was appropriated by faith. If your faith is shipwrecked, then your salvation also will be at the belly of the ocean. 
Because faith is the ship that your salvation rests on. And so if your faith is shipwrecked, it means your salvation is also shipwrecked. So your salvation is under attack if you continue in sin. God has forgiven you, but you have refused to appropriate forgiveness and walk in forgiveness. Rather, you took advantage of forgiveness and began to sin. God won't change himself because you, you are unreasonable. But your unreasonable nature has consequences ranging from being vulnerable to demonic attack because your faith is shipwrecked into the second thing I mentioned, not being able to participate in the kingdom into your faith being endangered. Have you not seen people? The people they taught in Sunday school are not their pastor. They never grow. The boy was seven years old. You were teaching him the story of Noah. Now the boy is 25. He's a pastor. You are still struggling with marijuana and he's your pastor. And he will lay hands on you and cast out demons. You want to go into business. He needs to pray to God for you. You that read the story of Noah to him. You read the story of Moses and Elijah to him. How Elijah caught down fire. Now he needs to pray to God for you. Because although you are a Christian for 30 years, but you are still wearing pampas. Because you've not grown above sin. That's the danger. You can't be relevant in kingdom. When God is doing something, he will remember you. Because you are not relevant. That's the danger of living in sin. Demons can harass you. God won't count you when he's doing his business. And your salvation is under attack. You may go to hell. Are you seeing it? So the issue of forgiveness is not the God part anymore. It's now on your part. He has forgiven you and given you a potential to live above sin. Forgiveness is a sign that is no longer angry with you and everything you need to live above sin is now available. 